Good morning. Uh, my name is George, and I'm uh, at El Paso Community College. Uh, I'm interested in uh, besides game studies, uh, literacy studies, and, and environmental rhetoric. Um, so this is part of a project that I did uh, for my master's, and uh, you know, put together into a chapter. And so I'm going to try to you know condense it into 20 minutes and just go over some of the the relevant stuff. And I did see a lot of connections. Uh, with what already has been discussed. Um, so I'm going to be looking at this uh, game of Metal Gear. And so who's already familiar with the Metal Gear series? <coughs> okay, good. Um, so my first uh, point here is just thinking about where I'm coming from in terms of game studies. Uh, so I really like this book from uh, uh, Jesse about the game is not the experience. It enables the experience, but it's not the experience. And I tie that into uh, you know, one of my, uh, probably my favorite book when it comes to game studies is uh, Tom Bissell's Extra Lives. And it's, uh, it's not technical at all. It's, it's, it's told in, in the form of a, you know, this autobiography, a memoir almost. And uh, he talks about what games mean to him and he goes over different games like the Grand Theft Auto series and, and other ones. Um, <clears throat> it's a really engaging read. Um, and he's, he says how, uh, you know, to interact with a creative work, uh, whether video game, an album, or film, etc., is in a real, real sense to be its co creator, to extract meaning, uh, to extract from its core, your own personal meaning. And so, in other words, you know, the, the game itself is, is just part of the picture, right? It's just a piece of the puzzle. Um, and so I'm going to be looking at uh, multiliteracies, which is this idea that, uh, you know, as we understand literacies now to be, you know, different from way back when in the 1900s, um, it's not just about, you know, learning to read and write, but, you know, visual information, uh, linguistic information, inf uh, knowledge about countries, etc. And I'm also going to be looking at the different modes of communication, what we understand to be uh, multimodalities uh, that we see in video games because they are, you know, uh, much more advanced than, you know, when I was growing up uh, with Super Mario. Um, and I define digital rhetoric here as the art of bit uh, communication, meaning it's, you know, discrete binary systems on and off. And, um, you know, one subset of digital rhetoric would be like screen modulated. Um, you know, so having games on on iPhones and, and uh, that would be a bit different because you know you're interacting with the screen itself. Uh, it's also, of course, different from nowadays. You know, I haven't kept up with VR and AR. Um, you know, Pokemon. I heard you all talking about. <laughs> I haven't played it, but um, you know, it's another form of digital rhetoric. Uh, and so I'm kind of behind the times of anything. Um, here's just uh, two screenshots. One is, um, you know, the uh, the menu where you get to select your weapon, and uh, and the view game. You know, it's, it's a bit different. I kind of prefer this old school style of it pauses, freezes the game so that you can select your weapon. Now it's more real time. You know, so you do have to uh, think about what weapon you're going to be using. Um, and then the other one is, um, and I, I should have warned, but uh, this is an, attempt, an attempted suicide. Um, and I'm going to go into that in a little bit. But, you know, we get cutscenes, we get pausing for the uh, selection of weapons, and then, of course, the actual action. Um, so in terms of my theory, I bring different uh, scholars here, but my, um, my primary ones are besides uh, those looking at literacy, James Paul Key being among, among the, the big names. Uh, I'm gonna be looking at uh, Burke's, uh, Kenneth Burke's rhetoric of rebirth. Uh, you know, this idea of um, kind of a secular form of, of the Christian, you know, uh, pollution, right, or original sin, or this idea of, of guilt that we're all imbued with. Um, purification, you know, which is the equivalent of like purgatory. And then uh, redemption, you know, which involves some kind of rebirth. Uh, the difference being that in, with Burke, it's it's symbolic. He, you know, he considers uh, our species as 
uh, the simply using animal in terms of what makes us different from all the other species. Um, and this we can see with one of the, with the, the protagonists. Zizek as well comes in because um, he has, you know, even though he's got a lot of crazy ideas, uh, <laughs> one of the ones that is rather in here is uh, this critique of uh, techno uh, bio ideology, which is, you know, looking at uh, uh, artificial intelligence and what that means in terms of how it's going to change things. Uh, looking at cloning and uh, looking at uh, the singularity of, you know, what someone like Kurzweil talks about, uh, which is when uh, humanity kind of reaches a kind of super state, you know, kind of like a super saiyan, but um, it's just because of its merging with technology. Um, and then I also look at nuclear rhetoric, and in terms of nuclear rhetoric, it's really interesting because um, <clears throat> there's a, so from Atari's 1980 arcade game Missile Command to 1985's Raid Over Moscow, uh, and the first Metal Gear, which was released in 1987, uh, in the Cold War, Cold War it's, it's not surprising to find nuclear warfare a subject of interest in the rapidly growing console era. And so this is a quote from the National Museum of, of American History, an exhibit called Information Age, People, Information, and Technology, stating, the scientists have to make dozens of calculations to create the, the bomb and determine its effects. Computers and atomic bombs, both products of World War II, grew up together. And this is actually the opening epigraph for Metal Gear Solid 2, uh, which is very postmodern. Uh, the ending, kind of the third act, takes a whole different direction. And uh, even the, the first act, many people were uh, criti criticized it because they were expecting it to be Solid Snake, but it goes into a whole different character. Um, but you know, the interesting thing about nuclear rhetoric that I, that I found most relevant was that. Um, they did make a lot of simulations, right? So in other words, it's almost like they were playing the game of using atom bombs before you know they dropped the ended up dropping the bombs. Um, and of course, that's where video games emerged is during that atomic age. Um, so, um, a nutshell summary of uh, middle, the fourth Middle Gear, at least. Uh, against the Patriots. Um, so it's set in 2014, and it's um, it's uh, it takes place at a time where it's essentially a dystopia. Uh, private, there's five private military companies, pretty PMCs that just have different uh, fight for power. Um, <clears throat> well, they're all commanded by uh, the antagonist uh, Liquid Asadat, who's the strange amalgam of of two different villains. Um, and then the, you're, you play the protagonist who saw the snake, here referred to as Old Snake because of the fixed not already aging. And uh, you know, th there's also a, a, another a broader antagonist here, a kind of, a, you know, a, uh, the, the body this AI known as the Patriots. Um, so different AIs that have uh, a, an AI that has control over different sections of society, essentially. Um, and ultimately, what, what the series highlights, you know, just like the other games, is that when it comes to war, you know, it's ultimately not about bringing peace, you know, but there's a lot of political machinations at play. Um, here's just an, exa an example of what you typically see as a player. And this relates here to digital rhetoric, just in terms of uh, the information that um, players navigate. You know, it's not just, of course, the player itself and the person, uh, but the, the four corners here dealing with different information. And those of us who grew up with uh, with this kind of screen, uh, you know, we, we, we know how to navigate this. You know, but if you give this game to like your grandmother, you know, she she's gonna there's a learning curve. Um, and I want to bring in a couple of terms that are relevant here. Uh, one is Ludo narrative, which is uh, the steps that take you know from take you from point A to point B. Um, so it's in other words, it's being able to tell the story via the gameplay. Uh, and I think this is what makes this is the unique affordance, what we call the the affordance of the genre. 
you know, that you can, you don't have to be on the nose, right, as far as, uh, you know, what, 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 what the story is through cutscenes, right? That's a very film-like, uh, uh, far from film. Uh, even though, ironically, uh, Metal Gear is known for these very long cutscenes, and actually holds the Guinness World Record for it as far as last time I checked. Um, Ludo narrative is what makes, is what has, games can do as a unique genre. The frame narrative is just like it sounds right where it, it does get, tell you the story and there is no interaction between the player and the story in that, in that case. Um, there's also a couple other terms. One is um, immersion, which is, you know, just like it sounds right, you feel like you're in the game uh, being present and engaged in the action. And then agency, you know, just the idea that you have to say about what the ending will be. Um, and more and more, I find that as a gamer, you have that control. You know, back then it was just like, you know, the, the, that princess will always be saved, you know. But more and more, it's like, well, you know, you screwed up here. Uh, but it didn't have to be this way. Um, in terms of literacies, you know, I mentioned the, the visual literacies. Uh, there's also just this idea that when a gamer plays, like they don't realize they're learning, right? And that's why a lot of people are trying to bring in games into the classroom as a form of pedagogy. Um, so it, it goes back to uh, James Paul Key, you know, who first kind of blowed open the doors for studying video games in this way. Um, and there's also, just from an action genre perspective, you know, the uh, studies that find that players who play action games can navigate information a lot more seamlessly than players who don't. Uh, and that's, you know, that's interesting, you know, because if you watch, like, your little cousin play these games, like, you'll be amazed at what they're able to do, dodge all these kinds of things, you know, multitask, you know, and, and to me, it's more all the more impressive because they get more and more complex as the, as the days go by. Uh, the other important thing in terms of literacies here is, um, you know, just the ideologies, the, the reframing of, of, of uh, you know, what does it mean to be a hero, what's war for, uh, you know, what is it good for, um, and uh, you know, the there is a investigation of what is what is a terrorist. You know, because in the second game in particular, uh, where it first starts, um, it, you know, you're, you actually play as a terrorist. Uh, he's, you know, Sonicy, who is the hero, is labeled a terrorist, but you know that he's not a terrorist, at least in, in what we, you know. So it's really interesting in that regard. Uh, in terms of Burke, uh, so first, you know, he undergoes pollution um, because he is injected with a virus called the, the Foxide virus. And um, he's also aware of that, you know, he calls himself as, you know, this, uh, this wonky biological weapon. Um, and in essence, he's also a vessel, because there's a sense of that uh, awareness of the fact that he's, he has to sacrifice himself because, you know, otherwise he's going to bring, of course, the demise of humanity. Um, and in essence, you know, he's, he can be seen as, as a scapegoat. You know, what Burke uh, refers to as a sacrificial animal upon his back, the bottom of the evils is richly and statistically loaded. Um, and Saint also functions as an anti-hero. Uh, not in the sense that he lacks the ability, but just that he's reluctant, you know, to take the helm. Um, and when it comes to Burke, one of the uh, interesting things is, uh, you know, he does uh, have this bit about uh, what does it mean for, you know, in terms of the nature-nurture debate, uh, for uh, us to uh, have clones, for instance, and Summit Snake is actually a clone of, of the, the protagonist that we'll see in, in Metal Gear Solid V, who's Big Boss, um, and w one, of the, one of the points about that is um, um, 
his reluctance to accept the label as hero, as Gigi calls uh, avoiding the inevitable, uh, points to the fact that our genes don't fully encapsulate who we are. In other words, as much as Snake dodged the label of hero, he could not dodge the essence of heroism delineated by his soldier genes, giving him the ability to overcome the greatest odds. As Dr. Hunter says, an ordinary man wouldn't even be standing by now, referring to his ability to survive the fox eye virus while everyone in, in, in infects does not. In other words, that's the irony that, um, you know, everyone around him is dying because of that uh, exposure to the fox eye virus, um, except for him. Um, and so the other point about that oh, is uh, the purification. And I really like this, this one of my favorite scenes in the game, uh, towards the, the climax, uh, before the final battle, is uh, his purification. And it comes in the form of a, a microwave oven, essentially, uh, that you have to navigate to, to get to a, mach a machine, essentially, that you have to shut down. Um, and so in this one, um, you know, there's this idea of the death wish um, that we see in, in, in burst, uh, pur purification, because he realizes that this is a suicide mission. Um, and, you know, it represents that symbolic scene of an old self, uh, you know, because after this scene, right, your whole body is just all scarred. And so, but you do end up surviving. Um, after that microwave scene, there is a rebirth. Uh, I did mention, you know, there is an attempt at suicide at the end, you know, because he realizes that he does have to, of course, do away with that virus. Otherwise, you know, everyone's gone. Uh, but then, you know, in a kind of a Deus Ex Machina, uh, Big Boss comes in and kind of just says, no, I mean, you, you're not going to die. And, uh, <laughs> and, you know, um, and so um, he tells him that, but then Big Boss himself dies because he gets exposed to the virus. Um, and uh, you know, the, the symbolic rebirth is this kind of revision of your ancestral self because Big Boss was in some ways his father, you know, in some ways his, of course, who he is the same person in a way because it's his clone. Um, I also wanted to cover, besides Burke, uh, empathy. You know, empathy is, is more and more steady nowadays. There's a new book bought by Paul Bloom about it. And, um, you know, just in terms of empathy here, I, I think it's important because you know, if you have those Call of Duty games, it's a very traditional, as far as I know, uh, game about like good guys and bad guys. But Metal Gear really does blur the line of who the good guys are, who the bad guys uh, are. And because of Snake's reluctance to be a hero, I think uh, it also, you know, might cause empathy for, for the for the for the gamer, especially because of. of the fact that it emphasizes stealth, it is a stealth genre over straight up action. So just this idea that you could theoretically go through the game through the game without killing anyone because you could avoid them or you can actually tranquilize them. It's really interesting in terms of what Kojima is trying to do in terms of you know having a game about war. Um, and so one of my favorite quotes is this idea, you know, he, I'm no hero, never was, I'm just an old kidder. How to do some, how to do some uh, wet work, and I'll end here with uh, this quote, you know, from Bissell uh, that really talk, goes into this idea of, the, of immersion and the doodle narrative, you know, the full body experience. He's talking here about Mass Effect, but uh, you know, this is applicable to Metal Gear. Uh, you lose track of your manipulation of it and its manipulation of you, and instead feel inserted so deeply inside the game that your mind and your feelings become seemingly crucial to its operation as its many minutes of violence and code. It's a sensation that the game itself is as suddenly and notably alive as you are. And this, I, you know, I experience as a gamer when I go through that microwave scene at the end. Um, but, you know, I think it's something to think about, right, in terms of uh, that sense of immersion that we feel with the game, you know, where even though we know Solid Sync is not us, you know, there's this kind of identification because in some ways it, it, it is us, you know, and it's kind of one of the points that Kojima makes in, in the new Metal Gear. Um, so, thank you.